Hi everyone, uh, my name is Phil Lopez. I am a postdoc at the University of Geneva, and I'm here today to talk about uh, combining emotion recognition, specifically with procedural content generation. Um, as just an aside, this presentation deals with a lot of audio and audio examples, and uh, as a personal recommendation, I would suggest that the viewers use headphones in order to fully experience uh, these examples. So uh, a lot of my work is really specifically in the domain of procedural content generation. And um, what PCG is exactly is, I guess, very simply, it can be uh, summarized as uh, algorithms and methodologies capable of generating content for digital games. And content can vary from level generation to other kinds of objects that populate the level or even the uh, game itself. Uh, my research in particular focuses from a perspective of emotional progression uh, that are contained within levels. So looking at levels as uh, emotional progressions for players to experience. And the way that I've been doing that is by exploring the interplay between the different digital game facets that exist and how they play with each other in order to guide the emotions of players. And so when I'm talking about facets, I'm basically talking about all of the artistic elements that combine, create this intense multimedia interactive experience that you know players are here to uh, enjoy. And these facets include the visual art of the levels or the game, sorry, uh, the audio, the narrative, and even the game's own mechanics. So just to uh, get a bit of my point across, I'd like to give a brief example of the power of multifacetedness on player emotion. So a game that I usually like to give as an example is this one of uh, Amnesia the Dark Descent. And I would really suggest while you're uh, watching this video clip to focus on both the audio, the visual aspect, and also the mechanics of the game themselves uh, in order to really see what uh, the interplay between all of these facets really uh, do emotionally for the player. So uh, just as an aside, when we talk about emotion recognition in the context of this presentation, I'm specifically referring to recognizing emotion in audio. And more specifically, what this means is that we're interested in analyzing the low level features of audio, such as that derive from the audio signal itself, and trying to detect the emotional perception of that piece of audio. And the reason why this is interesting is that we could combine the information that we obtain from these models and improve our level generation systems so that they can actually use and take advantage of this information or this emotional information of different audio pieces and populate the level with uh, different kinds of audio depending on the type of emotion we want that level to have. So. Uh, this is what we did for the Sonancia system, which is basically the core system that I did during my PhD, which basically consisted of generating levels based on a specific uh, frame of tension. So this is a progression of tension, which the level would try to adapt itself towards. And based on this, the level would then uh, apply sounds uh, based on the information from our model and populate the level with sounds that would try to follow the exact progression of emotion that we wanted that level to have. So uh, other types of approaches or other types of examples, sorry, could be uh, a more real-time approach. So while Sonancia generated the levels 
and sonify them entirely before the player could actually play the game, uh, we could have systems that actually uh, dynamically change the audio that is being played uh, in real time while the player is going through the level and by analyzing his physiology. So we could have a, an additional model that informs our system uh, the type of emotion that the player is currently feeling based on his uh, physiological state, such as his heart rate or his uh, skin conductance signal. And then the system could pick the most adequate sound to play in order to guide this player's emotional um, state. Um, but who, who speaks about audio can also speak about different facets that populate the level and particularly some things that I've been exploring have been uh, lighting, so such as just turning off the, the lights of a particular room could potentially stimulate the player to be a bit more tense than just having a very uh, li lighted room which is uh, entirely visible. So in order to um, apply uh, these kind of emotion recognition models, we need to gather uh, human data in order to uh, specifically annotate which sounds are more emotionally impactful than others. So in order to do this, we first need to define emotions so that um, participants and we ourselves can uh, clearly uh, analyze the types of emotion and express the emotions that are being felt by music. And um, in order to do this, we uh, analyze a lot of emotional psychology literature and a lot of work within the effective computing and emotional recognition domains. And within the literature, one of the most popular models used is this dimensional model of Russell, which uh, decomposes emotions in two different axes, one being the valence or pleasure, while the other axes being arousal or energy. And basically what this um, gives us is kind of a gradient of pleasure and energy of the different types of emotions that are felt by humans. And what this um, allows us to do is to uh, specifically ask uh, participants to uh, compare between different types of sounds based on how pleasurable they are or how energetic they are or even how tense they are. So in order to start collecting data, we had to design our own audio library so that participants could annotate. So here are some uh, examples of uh, audio pieces within our library. So for the annotation, uh, we decided to apply a rank-based approach, uh, which this means more precisely is that uh, participants are presented with two different sounds or a pair of sounds from the library, and they are tasked to rank between them. So which sound is more tense in this particular example, or more pleasurable or more arousing. And the reason for this is that uh, by using a rank-based system, we're kind of um, removing the numbers of uh, that exist, for example, in uh, rating scales such as Likert scales, uh, which can present a lot of ambiguity and social and cultural bias into uh, the annotation. Furthermore, in order to, for us to gather a lot of data, we decided to um, employ a crowdsourcing solution. So we actually developed a website um, that allowed participants to log on and listen to uh, a wide variety of different pairs and annotate them. So now that we have uh, annotation data or emotion annotation data, it's time to learn the relationship between the low level features of audio and this data specifically. So considering that we obtained pairwise annotations, we decided to apply a preference learning approach to learn the relationship between the low level features of audio and the annotations. 
And basically what we obtain by using preference learning is a predictive global ranking of all of the sounds uh, within our library. So basically it is uh, a comparison of emotional intensity uh, between each other. So which one is more intense in comparison to another pieces of sound. And um, during our experiments, the best results that we obtained was through rank support vector machines specifically. And um, although this does go in line with some of the literature within, within music emotion recognition, uh, more recent uh, work has looked uh, into using deep learning approaches, although it is often focused on attempting to extract more descriptive features of sound from the audio signal itself. And the reason for this is that um, we can extract a lot of different features from uh, audio. Uh, in our particular work, we um, extracted around 300 and so features um, and this was actually the smallest subset of features that we that we utilized. I've seen other types of work using a thousand, a thousand five hundred features, and I, f I believe I've even seen work using at least two thousand features. And the reason for this is that features can vary substantially based on the type of windowing methods used, where the most common tends to be the Han and the Hamming windowing methods and also the features um, themselves that can be extracted from uh, the energy spectrum, it can be extracted from the frequency domain, several types of different coefficients where the most popular one is the MFCC coefficients, which has been substantially used within uh, speech and speech emotion recognition specifically. So just to give an example, uh, here is the um, top five and the lowest five sounds that were predicted by uh, the best model that we were able to train. So um, one thing that we attempted to do uh, with less degree of success, I guess, was to uh, analyze if the emotional impact of one particular sound would change if we applied a digital signal processing effect on it. And basically what an effect does is kind of modulate the sound signal or even filter certain frequencies, such as an example as a high pass or low pass filter. And the idea of doing this would be to potentially increase the size of the library to use different degrees of the same sound by applying different types of effects and see if that would actually change the original emotional impact of that particular sound. So one of the main problems of uh, gathering data for these types of models is, is that if we're studying audio that tends to evoke similar kind of emotions, in people, we may obtain a vast amount of conflicting responses within our data set. So some participants might think that A is more tense than B, while other participants may find that B is more tense than A, which can make the problem more difficult to learn. Furthermore, um, these kinds of models rely on a lot of human annotations, which might make it difficult to actually gather data to um, create these models. Uh, furthermore, get, um, extracting features from uh, audio can also be quite difficult because there is no standard or let's say 
uh, cookbook or predefined features that are considered the best for emotion recognition. So what within literature people tend to do is try to extract as many features as possible and try to apply some sort of feature selection algorithm in order to determine which features are more important for emotion X, Y, Z. And that can uh, be quite difficult to actually pinpoint you know, what the, are the features that are just noise and uninteresting and what features are actually contributing to uh, describing the audio and the emotion that we're trying to learn. So uh, just to conclude my presentation, um, some of the things I've been working on has been on uh, analyzing the emotional impact change of sound depending on the contents of its environment such as how sound can change emotionally if you play it for example in a full lighted room or a dark room for example and i've also been looking at the ideas of orchestrating different facets within levels such as creating systems that are capable of kind of puppeteering the different facets of such as lights um, the audio that is being played and certain events within different sections of the level in order to uh, kind of tailor the emotional progression of a level to each player. And yes, that concludes my presentation. I thank you very much for paying attention and uh, I believe that I will be in the chat room to take any questions that you have. And yeah, thank you very much and uh, see you soon.